pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome to my channel. Wow, I've only got a maybe two more Fridays or two more weeks to use this spot because I'm moving on June 23rd and it won't be feasible to come back to this spot. This would be uh, a 10 minute bus ride, maybe transferring once and then walking five or 10 minutes. So no, I won't ever come back here. So I have been loved filming out here despite all the <laughs> auditory challenges. <laughs> We've got a little bit of a uh, construction noise, but I, I think it'll be okay. Two more weeks, people, and I haven't spent very much time wandering around my new neighborhood, but maybe I'll find some similar kind of little parkets. I know that there's going to be a large actual park that's being created and will be opening uh, this sum sometime this summer. Maybe it's already open, but it's going to be opening very soon and it's about a three minute walk from my house. So that will probably become my new spot. Anyway, I have had maybe one of the best reading weeks of 2018. All of which is to say that I've been fabulous at distracting myself and putting off packing and getting organized for my move. So I've had a fabulous reading week. I haven't started really doing anything for my move. So this weekend, I have to. Two weeks in a day, people. <laughs> While that helicopter goes overhead, let's get this coffee going. Well, maybe. Good lord. It seemed like it was kind of circling around right above me, but I'll keep going. So yeah, I finished two books this week. And I don't want to talk too much on my Friday reads about either one of them. Because because of other videos in progress or whatnot. One was the novel West by Karis Davies that I kept putting off for weeks and weeks. And I finally ended up doing it as a buddy read with Doris and we have experimented with a new style of vlog. You can check it out if you haven't, if you're interested, but I wanted to make the vlog collaborations more interactive. And so we have done, basically filmed a conversation about the book. Part two will go up in the next couple days, maybe. But uh, I was quite happy with how part one turned out. And it takes a little bit more collaboration and fiddly uploading and downloading and splicing videos together. But I think it feels just like a conversation. So yeah, I really enjoyed uh, working on that with Doris. So I don't want to say too much about the book. It was a five star read for me. I thought it was pitch perfect and not for everybody. It was a very strange story that wouldn't ring bells for every reader, but rang all my bells. And I said in my Goodreads view review today that Oscar Wilde said, I cannot think otherwise than in stories. And now I, Sean the Book Maniac, say, I won't be able to think about America from here on in without casting my mind back to the novel West by Karis Davies, so that's all I'll say for now. All right. That helicopter is stalking me. Go away. I don't even know if it's a helicopter. What else would it be? I also started and finished this, Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont by Elizabeth Taylor. This was my first Elizabeth Taylor novel. I absolutely loved it. This was a buddy read with Mel of Mel's Bookland Adventures and I think I found a new favorite author. I mean, I'll have to read more by her, but this was so fantastic. Written in 1971, it was one of her later novels. Mel and I will be doing a collaborative review. And it's about a fascinating elderly lady who moves into a, a hotel, but it's a hotel that's mostly peopled by el senior citizens, and there's no nursing care provided, but it's just one step 
away from having to go into some kind of nursing care home. Completely unflinching and unsentimental and very emotional and funny. The writing is just fantastic. On the spectrum of fabulous British writers, I would put her smack dab in the middle of Barbara Pym and Muriel Spark. I could feel uh, both writers uh, evoked in the way that Elizabeth Taylor told this tale. Watch for our review. Sadly, I have one bail that I wasn't, well, maybe I was maybe it wasn't completely unexpected, but still feel a little bit sad about it. I bailed on Meg Wolitzer's The Female Persuasion on the penultimate page of chapter one. I started the first couple pages and I was so delighted to, to find that the typical Meg Wolitzer magic was happening on the page. I loved her last novel, The Interesting. That was a Marmite book for many a reader, but I loved it. And this started out with that same vivacity and uh, wit, and I was sucked right in. But by not too far into the first chapter, that Wolitzer, Wolitzerian verve was no longer hooking me. And what was pushing me away was that this is a story about a social political movement. I was cynical about that going in, and maybe that clouded what, you know, I prejudiced myself against it. I'm very pleased with the first few pages. But this is nothing to argue about. Several of my bookish friends, whose opinions I respect the highest, love this book. So there's nothing to argue about here. But for me, you can't, I don't want to read fiction and I'm not drawn deeply enough into any kind of a fictional narrative that is centered on a social political movement. It's just not the stuff that the fiction that jumps off the page for me is made of. Like, it's not that I'm not interested in feminism. I am. I consider myself a sort of feminist. But I'm also a gay rights proponent and have been an activist, but I have no desire to read a book about a bunch of gay activists. Uh, one of the worst books that I read in the last few years, and I'm going to blank, I always blank on the title, but it was uh, set during the Seattle protests, and it just made me sick. And I could just feel by the end of chapter one that this was going in a similar direction, and maybe I've given her short shrift, but just wasn't just wasn't happening there's a mentor and a mentee relationship and that is just at least the way it was written here so deeply disinteresting in fiction I mean I can't think of a novel that I've loved that was centered on the social political movement whether it be communist or whatever you name it it just it would be a very boring bad book for me so Sorry. Sorry, Meg. Not this time. And I've started three books this week, and uh, these have all started out fabulously, and I'll save the best for last. Uh, but the, otherwise, they're not ranked in order of preference. Summer will show by Sylvia Townsend Warner. This is a, a buddy read. I forgot to say that Female Persuasion was going to be a buddy read with Amy Yuki Vickers, and I bailed on her, so sorry, Amy. Uh, um, this is a buddy read with Bertha Bowler and Eric Carl Anderson, and we haven't started checking in really with each other yet. This is just the end of week one, but I'm enjoying it. I don't really know what I think of it yet. Very unlikable protagonist. I mean, she's fascinating, so I'm, I'm not having a bad time. The writing, I can't decide if I like the writing yet, but I'm, it's interesting writing. It's very different pro style, written in 1939, but in a way the pro style feels much older. The setting of the story is much older, so maybe that was intentional. But yeah, it's interesting. I'll have much more to say later. And and of Beyond the Pages and I have begun our buddy read of A Lot to Ask, the biography of Barbara Pym by Hazel Holt, and it's going very well. I think we've done three chapters so far. We're going to do five a week, so i got two more to do by Sunday. I would say the writing is just so-so. I mean, I don't expect much from biographical writing. It's usually terrible. And I wouldn't say this is terrible, but it's not the writing. But I'm just, Ange and I are both so damn fascinated by Barbara Pym. So 
Now we want to reread, even after the first three chapters, we want to go back and reread all of the Barbara Pym novels that we've read in light of what we now know about her life. She was a sexually liberated, mischievous young woman with a twinkle in her eye, and that is woven throughout her fiction. So, yeah, really enjoying it. And uh, I have to say that the one that I replaced the female persuasion with is the one that's captured my imagination the most of all of them. And this is not a buddy read, so I, I can pace myself with this one because I don't have to keep up with anybody's schedule, but this is the one I want to read all the time since I started it a couple days ago. Michelle de Kretzer's The Life to Come. I've talked about it. I think I did a page 112 tag maybe. I forget what I did. I first found out about it from Kendra Winchester who raved about it, and Kendra and I rarely agree on a book, but <laughs> as I said before, she said in her review or a wrap-up or something, she said, if you like Virginia Woolf, you'll love this book. I'm looking at you, Sean the Book Maniac. <laughs> and that got my attention, so I have started it. And I, I'm 15 pages in, and I'm already... And I often fall in love with a book in its first 15 pages, so take this with a grain of salt. But I'm going to read you an extended passage, two and a half pages, to finish up this Friday Reads. And I think a, a sizable percentage of you, dear subscribers, will fall in love with the prose as well. So, so far it's set in Sydney and George has moved into his elderly cousin's home because his elderly cousin, I don't think he's even had ever met the cousin, went into the hospital and then somehow he invites her as one of his former students, Pippa, somehow it's kind of crazy it ends up sharing the house with him so far there's no romantic sexual anything between them but this is what there is between them Pippa is the young woman and George is the professor but he's not that old either I don't know maybe he's 40 I'm not sure in Merrickville over Vegemitty toast one morning Pippa asked whether the barking wasn't getting to George he hadn't noticed it but now heard the high repetitive protest that went on and on He's lonely, poor love, said Pippa, and bored, stuck in a yard by himself with nothing to do for hours. Greeks, said George, they don't like animals indoors. It's a Mediterranean thing, the Arab influence. Pippa said that in Mudgee they were exactly the same. And no one in Vince's family has ever been outside New South Wales. No way do they know any Arabs either. A few days later, she told George that the dog's name was Bruce. He belonged to a hippie dipstick called Rhiannon, who was renting on the cheaper landward side of the street. Pippa had grown up in a country town and still talked easily to strangers. Bruce was a Kelpie cross, George learned. Twelve months ago, Rhiannon got him from the RSPCA. She drives him to an off-leash park when she's got time but she works in some mall up in Chatswood, so she's got this huge commute. And then Tuesday night's the ashram, Friday night's the pub. She's not a bad person, she just hasn't got a clue. You should see her yard. She's bought Bruce all these toys, like a dog's a child. Pippa had offered to walk Bruce when Rhiannon was busy. He's a working dog, he needs exercise. Guess what she said? Dogs should run free. It's demeaning for an animal to walk on a lead. It does really confusing things to their auras. It was good of Pippa to have tried to help, said George. I just feel so sorry for that poor dog. She said the same thing a few evenings later. Bruce was barking again. George heard him all the time now. It was difficult not to hold Pippa responsible. I love animals, she went on. That must be why you eat so many of them, said George. He didn't intend on kindness, but was opposed to illogic. Pippa's fondness for broad, blurry statements twitched his nerves. I love India, she once announced, after watching a documentary on TV. She had never been there. George, who had, most certainly did not love India. He could also see that these declarations weren't really about animals or India, but about Pippa. What they proclaimed was her largeness of heart. She was saying that she had considered being a vegetarian. 
But the thing with personal food restrictions is they make eating with other people really difficult. They destroy conviviality. She brought out conviviality in the way people had once said England or communist, as if it settled all discussion. George detected a borrowing. Pippa had come across the word somewhere and been impressed. George looked on cooking as time stolen from books. When he invited Pippa to move in for the summer, he hadn't thought about arrangements for food. He would have been content to go on as usual, defrosting a pizza or grilling a chop. But the day after she moved in, Pippa said, I'm going through a Thai phase. You can't cook Thai food for one. The cold, white, murderous kitchen, filled with the scent of coriander and lemongrass, pounded to a paste. George kept the fridge stocked with Riesling and beer. Pippa stir-fried fish with spring onions and purple basil. She served a salad that combined ginger and pork. With nothing said, they divided the house between them. There were three empty bedrooms on the upper floor, but Pippa installed herself in a room off the hall. She liked to lie reading on a divan that stood under an aluminum framed window. There was nothing else in what must have been the old man's living room. He had dotted cumbersome furniture throughout the house. Any one of his rooms would have done as the set of a European play, the forbidding, minimalist kind. Paperback novels accumulated around the divan. George looked them over one day when Pippa was out. Most were second-hand and all had been published in the past 20 years. Pippa read nothing older nothing in translation, and very little that didn't concern women's lives. Her knowledge of history was cloudy. Referring to a biography of Joan of Arc that she planned to read, she placed its heroine in the Napoleonic Wars. George's own novel sang inside him. He was taking apart everything he knew and putting it back together differently in ruled A4 notebooks. He used a laptop for his thesis, but his novel had woken an instinct that mingled superstition and veneration, and he was writing the first draft by hand. All right, so that may not be the type of writing that hooks all of yous, but I think it's going to hook a quite substantial sum of yous, so let me know what you think. I am just immersed in this novel. So I'm going to spend the rest of today, uh, no, I'm going to spend half of today packing and the other half reading. Yeah, that's it. But anyway, I want to get a lot of reading done today and a little bit of video editing. I have to say that probably I'm not going to have very many videos. I will commit to Friday reads for sure. I've got a few page 112 tags in the pipeline and there'll be a few book reviews and stuff for all i know i'm going to continue to distract and put stuff off by doing book tour videos but if i'm smart if i'm a responsible adult there won't be so many videos until after my move on june 23rd but i will always do a friday reads even if it's a two minute one yeah right two minute video from me uh-huh on that happy note, what's going on reading-wise or otherwise in your weekend? Thanks for watching.